lecture studying the design of beams uh and i think it is justified because uh this is sort of uh, <clears throat> an involved uh <clears throat> concept in the entire syllabus and this is also going to help us when we study the design of slabs uh because it is it is the design procedure is very similar to what we do in beams uh last time we sort of rushed through to finish doubly reinforced beams wherein we looked at uh, when are doubly reinforced beams used uh, how are how are they analyzed uh, we actually looked at a very short version or or a very concise version of the analysis of doubly reinforced beams we did not get into the design uh, uh, uh be before that in the light in the light of the recent events that, that have been happening i really urge you to make sure that your mics are not on so <clears throat> we just looked at the design of doubly reinforced beams and uh, the analysis of doubly reinforced beams and then this is where we stopped okay so last time uh, since we were in a little bit of hurry to finish this up there was something that i could not explain and uh, i wanted to explain it <clears throat> so that we have all our equations uh <clears throat> excuse me we have all our equations perfectly matching so uh if you remember last time uh the way we looked at w intersection a uh, w intersection is a singly reinforced section that has some amount some portion of the ast and then the concrete about the neutral axis which sort of act together to resist moment and the remaining amount of reinforcement on the tension side which balances out the reinforcement in the compression side so we sort of divided our real section into these two uh, virtual sections and then we analyzed them and then we came up with a set of equations for moment of resistance and for the depth of neutral axis so here what we had done last time is uh just a minute yeah so we had added a term for 5 fck here and then multiply this entire thing by asc um uh, today i just want to explain the reason why we did it so in general the say the actual load and compression is equal to the actual load carried by concrete or the compression in concrete plus the compression in steel okay uh, now the compression in concrete is equal to area of concrete times the stress in concrete plus area of steel times the compressive stress compressive stress in steel okay uh, now i can rewrite this as uh <clears throat> the gross area minus area of steel times area of concrete uh, times uh, stress in concrete plus area of steel uh, perhaps i'll write c here also implying area of steel in compression times uh, fsc now i can rewrite this as the gross area into stress in concrete plus asc uh sorry fsc minus fc times area of steel in compression okay so this so the first term so the first term implies the <clears throat> contribution of concrete and the second term okay this is a typo yeah and the second term implies the compression in steel <clears throat> so we divided this as the contribution of concrete and steel 
and that is why we could write cuc is equal to 0.36 fck bxu now please understand that bxu is the gross area it is not the area of concrete it also includes this area also includes uh area of steel and therefore it is gross area and it is not only the area of concrete and to compensate for that we sort of rearrange this and write it in this form and therefore when you when we write the compressive force in in steel it will have a term fsc minus the stress in concrete now why now a question obviously as to why is the stress in concrete 0.45 ck because if you look at this very the, the the rebar is located very close to the maximum compressive strain and therefore we can expect this the stress here to be 0.45 ck here where there's, there's a rectangle so we'll have a term fsc minus 0.45 ck into asc and therefore uh, please make this correction in your notes just uh, if you if you want it for your understanding you can also write this down here this but this is not a part of our derivation this is just for your understanding <clears throat> so i'll just correct our equation here sc minus 0.45 times fck times asc these equations might seem to be uh, uh, say very difficult or very long at the first instance but if you understand the origin of this or if you understand how these equations have come up i'm sure it's, it's no big deal to remember them so this would be fsc minus 0.45 fck <laughs> Any questions here? <clears throat> Similarly, we'll have uh, an additional term here. FSC minus 0.45 times FCK. Uh, any questions? Any part of it you do not understand? Ishan, do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. So we'll just quickly solve a couple of problems and uh, uh, we'll 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 get on with our next topic. Uh, please write down <clears throat> uh, an RCC beam. An RCC beam, three hundred by seven hundred overall in section, three hundred by seven hundred overall in section, is reinforced with is reinforced with 
10 bars of 20 mm diameter 10 bars of 20 mm diameter in tension zone in tension zone and 3 bars of and 3 bars of 16 mm diameter in compression zone and 3 bars of 16 mm diameter in compression zone with an effective cover of 25 mm with an effective cover of 25 mm calculate moment of resistance of the beam calculate moment of resistance of the beam consider the beam made of consider the beam made of m40 concrete m uh, m40 concrete and fe250 steel and fe 250 steel so let us look at the given data first the width is 300 the total depth is 700 then we have uh, 10 bars of 20 mm diameter can someone please tell me the area of a rebar of diameter 20 How much is it? 314. Yes. So it is approximately 314 mm square. So 10 times 314 is 3140 mm square. Then we've also been given that there is reinforcement in the competition zone as well, which involves uh, three bars of 16 mm diameter. So three times the the area of 16 mm diameter bar is approximately 201 so this is equal to 3 oh sorry 603 mm square then further we have been given that fck is 40 megapascals and then fy is uh, 250 mega uh, 250 megapascals yes So this is the given data, just a small sketch which is in line with our data. So here we have 10 bars of 20 mm diameter. Now, one thing that is a slightly different in this question is, uh, I've told you the difference between clear cover and effective cover. And I've also told you that when the question says, uh, so and so with a cover of 25 mm so when it says when it only says cover it always means that it is or it is safe to assume that it means that it nominal cover or clear cover so in the last question that we did they had not mentioned the cover to be effective therefore we assumed it to be clear and then we found out effective cover but in this question it is clearly stated that the effective cover is 25 mm okay now let us uh, put the practicality on a back foot right now because uh, it is not possible to put 10 bars of 20 m diameter in one row therefore there are going to be multiple rows and that would change the effective cover and so on but that is that is not sort of our objective here to think about how practical this question is this is just uh, uh, this is just a way of understanding how the analysis works that's it so we'll just proceed with whatever is given in the question 
the effective cover that is d dash is 25 mm ast is 10 bars of t20 which is 3140 and then we also have three bars uh, on the compression side so we just put them here Okay. Uh, so uh, just like we did in singly reinforced sections, the first step is since since we're not sure if the section is under reinforced or reinforced, uh, we start with, with an assumption that the section is under reinforced. So the first thing that we do is that assume that the section is under reinforced. OK, but here we have one more term. If I go back. OK, just a moment, I think I. OK, so if we look at XU, the term that we sort of. Uh, we are not sure about the value of the term. There was only one term before, which was. Uh, which was FST. But now we have another term FSC whose value we're not sure of. In order to ensure the value of FST, we assume the section to be under reinforced. And then we found out the value of XU. We compared it with XU max. And if XU was less than XU max, then it was safe to assume that FST is 0.87 FI. But here we have one more value that we're not sure of, that is FSC. So another assumption that we make here is, the, the first assumption is assume the section to be under reinforced. Okay, and the second assumption is, and assume, FSC is equal to 0 0.87 times FY. Okay, and then as usual, by force equilibrium, that is by, by using CU is equal to TU, we are definitely going to have <coughs> one more term here which is the stress in steel and compression minus 0 0.45 times FCK times the area of steel in compression. This is nothing but the term that we saw here. So CU is equal to TU. We have seen that TU is FST into AST, and then we split CU into two into two terms, that is the, the compression in concrete and the compression in steel. The compression in concrete is 0.36 FCK BXU. And when we simplify it further, we get everything in terms of XU. So XU is this. So I've just rewritten this here. Uh, now, if you want the exact equation, I'll just write this. So FST, AST minus FSC minus 0.45 FCK into AC upon 0.3 FCK B. Now, with our assumptions, what we can write, is we can write FST is 0 0.87 times of FY, because we have assumed the section to be under reinforced, and FSC as well, we can write it 0 0.87 times of FY because this is something that we have assumed. Okay, so now we just plug in all the values. So someone will have to calculate this quickly for us. So 
0 0.87 times of fy. What is the value of fy here? So we have been given that fy is 250 megapascals. So 0 0.87 into f into 250. Then the value the, uh, the value of AST is 3140, which are 10 bars of 20 mm diameter. FI again is 250. FCK is 40 megapascals. And ASC is 603 mm square. Then 0.36 FCK is 40. B is 300. Can someone please calculate this for us quickly? By then, any questions here? Uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay. So, any questions, please let me know if it is. Uh, if if you're going too fast, please let me know. Can someone please quickly give me a value of XU? Actually, it shouldn't take that long. One thirty point two. 130.2 is it so uh, would someone please verify this uh would you please tell me the unit also 132 mm 132 130.2 mm, what mm yeah because this is effective depth, since this is depth, it has to be mm. Can someone please verify this? Um, yeah, it is correct. Okay. okay. OK, now we since we have the value of XU, next step is to find out the value of XU max, compare XU with XU max, and only then we can say if our section is under reinforced or over reinforced. So for FE 250, does someone recall what is the value of XU max in terms of D? mm. 75 mm. How did you calculate that? Uh, the D uh, first uh, 700 minus 25 mm clear cut, so we will get the D. No, 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 I'm not asking the value of D. I am asking if someone remembers what is XU max for FE250 oh. in terms of D. Oh, it's 0 0.58. 0 0.5. Eight. Three. So let's quickly go back. And for FE 250, 0.53. So it is quintessential that you remember these values for different grades because if you are stuck here, you cannot go ahead. So you remember this 0 0.53, 0 0.48, 0 0.46, 0 0.44. Very simple. So this is 0.53 times D. So 0.53 times. Now, what is our D? Now, perhaps I'll just I'll just write it here itself because it's it's easier that way. So our capital D is 700. Then we have also been given that our D dash, which is our effective cover, is equal to 25 mm, and therefore our effective depth is capital D minus uh, D dash. Uh, which is equal to 700 minus 25, which is equal to 675 mm. So please uh, write this in the given data. So this is 675 
Okay, just in case you want to copy this. Yeah. So 0.53 times of 675. So 0.53 times. No, oh, I just repeated it. Sorry. 0.53 times D. So 0.53 times 675. How much is it? Three fifty seven point seven five mm. Okay, now we have to compare XU with XU max. We see that one thirty point two is less than three fifty seven point seven five. Therefore, our XU is less than XU max, and this section is under reinforced section. Therefore, our assumption is true. Okay. And hence we can say that FST is equal to 0.87 FY. Okay, now we have made another assumption that FSC is equal to 0.87 FY. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, can someone sort of add in as to how can we prove that this assumption is also correct or wrong? How can we test this assumption? Okay. <clears throat> so we want to find out uh, what is the stress in steel and compression. OK, so what we will need for this is what is the strain in steel and compression? So how do we find out this strain? Now we already know that for this section. We know that. This strain here is 0 0.0035. OK, and we also know the depth of a neutral axis. We know the depth of our neutral axis and we also know this depth to be D dash. Therefore, by using similar triangles, we can find out what is the strain here. And by using this strain, we can find out what is the stress here. It may seem too complicated, but if you remember, we have already worked out an equation here. Considering similar triangles, epsilon SE is equal to this. So I'll just Rewrite this. So epsilon SC, please note that this is epsilon and SC is in suffix. So epsilon SC is equal to XU minus D dash upon XU times 0.0035. So just uh, plugging in all the values, our XU is 130.2. 130.2 minus D dash, which is 25. It is given in the problem. Then XU is 130.2. Okay, just give me a moment to rearrange this. Can someone please give me a value for this? Zero point zero zero two eight. Zero point zero zero two eight three. 
Okay. So we <clears throat> so now we've sort of got this value as 0 0.00283. Okay. Now we have assumed that epsilon SC is equal to sorry, FSC is 0.8 and FY. Now my question is when will the stress be 0.87 times of Fy. Now, if we look at the R stress strain curve, we have assumed that this value of stress is 0.87 Fy. Okay, so this happens only when our strain, that is epsilon s, is equal to epsilon s star. I hope you remember this epsilon s star. <clears throat> so just a quick reminder epsilon st is equal to epsilon c star is equal to 0 0.002 plus 0 0.875 five by es meaning that the steel has yielded and therefore we can say that the stress in steel is 0.87 times of fy so if this value of epsilon sc is greater than epsilon st star then our assumption is correct that FSC is equal to 0.87 times of FY. So <clears throat> now epsilon S star is equal to 0 0.002 plus 0.87 into FY upon ES. So this is equal to 0 0.002 plus 0 0.87 into 250, which is F5, upon ES, which is 2 into 10 power 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And this is equal to <clears throat> 0 0.00. 0.0. So when we compare these values, we see that epsilon SC, epsilon SC is less than epsilon S star, which sort of means that our assumption is false. And what it means is FSC is less than 0 0.87 times of FY. Had this value been greater, the it would it would sort of <clears throat> indicate that the steel in compression has yielded, which means FSC is equal to 0.87 FI and we would get a closed form solution. But unfortunately, our assumption has failed here. And uh, we have sort of looked at last time what happens when our assumption of an under reinforced section or, or here the assumption of the stress in con uh, the stress in steel being less than 0.87 FI happens. If I go back to that problem, wherein we were stuck. So the assumption was false. Uh, FST was less than 0.87 FY. And then we wrote a statement that since, <clears throat> since FST is less than 0.87 FY, uh, and this is an over-reinforced section. So, uh, okay, here the section is not over-reinforced. 
okay but here since we we cannot find out what is the stress in the stevian compression this does not give us a closed form solution and hence this is an iterative process if you remember we wrote about strain compatibility so in this case we'll write the same statement here so please write down in the above section or in this section fsc is less than 0.87 fy fsc is less than 0.87 fy and we do not get a closed form solution and <clears throat> they and we do not get a closed form solution full stop xu will have to be computed xu will have to be computed by strain compatibility method xu will have to be computed by strain compatibility method to get the actual moment of resistance to get the actual moment of resistance okay so a final step that we can do is though we cannot find out exactly what is the maximum moment of resistance but we can always find out what is <clears throat> sorry though we cannot find out what is the actual moment of resistance but we can always find out what is the maximum moment of resistance which is mu max okay so uh, we'll just conclude this problem saying that the maximum moment of resistance of this section which is mu max now what we have to do in mu max is we just have to rewrite the equation for mur replacing x by x, xu by xu max so we just have to write, rewrite this equation by replacing xu by xu max and that is what we have done in the past as well so, uh, yeah here yeah. So m u r is equal to m max, so n x u is equal to x u max, and we just replace x u by x u max here, and we are going to do the same thing here. So we already have an equation for m u r. You just have to replace x u by x u max. So 0.36 f c k b into x u max d minus 0.42 times of x u max f s c minus 0.45 f c k a s c into d minus d dash. So this is equal to 0.36 times f c k, which is 40 times b. Time x u max, which is three fifty seven point seven five into uh, d six seventy five minus zero point four two times three fifty seven point seventy five. That is the end of the first term plus f s c, which is <clears throat> zero point eight seven times of fy which is 250 minus 0 0.45 times fck which is 40 this times asc which is three bars of 16 m diameter which is 603 
times d minus d dash, which is uh, 575 minus d dash is 25. D is 675. Um, yes, correct. And yeah, correct. So you take your time to calculate this. I think there should be around 889 kilonewton meter. Okay. Uh, but please verify this because I've just calculated it. <clears throat> so this is the maximum moment that the section can resist. OK, so in case this assumption turns out to be true. There's nothing different that we have to do. We just have to calculate MUR and not use and use XU in place of XU max here. Nothing else. And in case the assumption is true, please don't write that statement saying that we have to work it out by using strain compatibility because that would be stupid because we already have our assumption proved. <clears throat> okay, so with this, we wind up lecture. Did you guys study this for today? Did you guys study this topic for today's test? Yes. What, what about others? <coughs> OK, I take it as a yes. And uh, since I've known about your commitment since last semester, I've set up a slightly difficult test <clears throat> this time. I hope you're okay with it. And uh, I also plan to reduce the time that is being allotted to solve this test. So should we start or do you want to break? Hi, can we stop and then uh, my, elect uh, my electricity is going to go? In oh, 10 minutes. OK, so. Uh, in that case, you have only 10 minutes. Since there's no electricity in a place, it would be unfair if we sort of go on solving the paper when we know that she cannot do it. So what I'll, I'll just. Start accepting responses. And. Uh, Here you go. Please let me know if there's any problem in terms of submitting the paper, opening it. Can you access it? already too much engaged into solving it. I'm asking if you can access the paper. Yeah, we can. Yes. OK, great. So we'll close it at 10 o'clock.
Are you guys done? Do you guys need more time? Yes. Yes, please. Y yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The the laptop can still go on for some time without electricity, no? Like. Oh. Good argument. But her internet perhaps won't.
guys please start submitting your responses <clears throat> i will stop accepting responses at 10:06 just so that we are on the same page as a clock on your screen i will not accept any responses after 10:06 either in the form of screenshots or whatsapp messages or we have a minute more please submit your responses Thirty seconds to go. Sorry, one minute. Yeah, thirty seconds to go. Is everybody done? Is everybody done? Okay, I'm I'm closing the response window. I'm done. Okay, seventy-two responses recorded, and I the result is quite uh, promising. Actually, a lot of you have scored. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Uh, it's 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 good news that a lot of you have scored more than ten. Uh, now I just want to discuss a few questions that I'm sure a lot of you have uh, have. It might be a little challenging for you to answer those questions. So let's get to those. Uh, sorry, yeah. but uh, I I sent like I submitted like right before you said. Uh, yeah. I'm sh shutting. Yeah, same. Yeah, it still didn't get recorded. But okay. you said that, like. It okay, so I gave you enough time to do it. I I said multiple times that submit it. You don't have to wait till the last moment. Okay, this is not the first test that you've given. I I I like. It must be the internet. Like I submitted it before you said so. Also the last time, and it, I've never faced this issue. Like I'm sorry. I what what can we do now? Okay, we'll discuss it after the lecture. Uh, so one question that I'm sure a lot of you one must have. One question that I'm sure a lot of you. Uh, <coughs> this, uh, can you hear me? There's an echo. I can hear my own voice. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. Okay. So, question number two, which says that which of the following sections is or are likely to fail by crushing of concrete? Uh, a majority of answered over reinforced section, which is partially correct, because uh, you know we have said we have discussed this multiple times that irrespective of the type of the section, the ultimate failure always happens by crushing of concrete. In an under reinforced section, the failure starts by yielding of steel, but ultimately the Collapse occurs by crushing of concrete. We have seen this in the experimental video that we saw. Even in the orient for section, though the failure sort of starts. So the, in the orient for section, the failure starts itself by the crushing of concrete. So irrespective of what the type of section is, the the final failure always occurs by crushing of concrete. So the correct answer is all of the above. Then. Uh, this but Bhagavad didn't mention like how do you, do you know whether when it starts feeling or how what the end state is end state of each section is so like some of us are confused. Um, so the following sections is a right to favor crushing of concrete. So um, when we say that is it is the start of failure failure we normally refer to a, refer uh, it. As the limit state of flexure, okay. But when you are talking about failure, it's it's the ultimate failure. So at limit state of flexure, yes, under reinforced sections uh, sort of start failing by the yielding of steel. And at ultimate limit 
state of lecture or reinforced sections fail by crushing of concrete but ultimately the, uh, the ultimate failure occurs by crushing of concrete in all types of sections so perhaps i, I just take care of this uh, uh, next time i next time i present this question that I'll, I'll just make sure that it is the final failure that i'm talking about and not the ultimate limit state of lecture yeah okay okay so question number three good 87 88 percent right answer four straightforward five straightforward six okay why did a lot of you answer 0.87 fck is it just because 8.87 sounds sounds uh, familiar because it is clearly mentioned that what is the average design compressive stress in concrete 87 has nothing to do with concrete so 0.36 fck is the right answer we've all we also derived this so there's no question of answering 0.87 fck seven very straightforward eight uh you had to do some calculations here but i'm glad that most of you have done it correct it is just force equilibrium you just have to find out the value of xu and all the other questions are linked to question number eight so once you get question number eight eight correct automatically you sort of get in line uh, of of answering nine ten and and so on correctly so question number nine very good ten uh i am not sure why it, a lot of you have answered buckling but what type of failure mechanism is is the section likely to experience since this is a beam there's no question of buckling here buckling occurs in columns so it can be either a ductile failure or brittle failure so majority of you have checked ductile which is good but there's no logic in selecting buckling uh, how much moment can the above section resist? Again, a very straightforward. You just have to go go on and you know plug in the values in the formula for moment of resistance. And here, yes. Now a lot of you have selected 130 to 135 kilonewton meter. I suppose you did not divide it by 1.5 because when the question is how much load it can safely apply, we always have to calculate what is the service load. So make sure that you divide it by 1.5 to get the final value. But fortunately, more than 50% of you have got it right, which is which is good. So I just take this as a sign that a lot of you have understood flexure, which is a good thing. Even with this one one, actually uh, with this one topic, you are in line to score about 25 to 30 marks in the exam. So that is how important flexure is, and that's the reason why we have spent so much time on it. Okay, so uh, we'll just take a short break uh, and we'll resume at 10.15 and uh, we'll continue with uh, the next topic, which is the design of reinforced concrete columns. Okay, in the meantime, if someone has questions, I'm available for discussion. Um, Bhargav, uh, yeah. when, when I submitted the test, I think my internet was uh, like wasn't working or something, but it, 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 after that it wasn't getting recorded then. So, um, like what should yeah, I do? Yeah, I, like Zoe and I also faced the same issue. Okay. Um, and even Sayukta has sent a message in the chat saying the same. Okay. So, okay. Um, do you uh, do you happen to have any record of the test that you've given? Um, I try going back in the thing and then send you screenshots. Maybe I'll just try if it shows it. Still. Yeah, you know, I'll try that. Okay. It's. It's not going back in my, at least. Okay. Okay, no problem. Just wait until the class yeah, gets over. I can't go back to the questions. Yeah, normally it doesn't happen. Yeah. So uh, let the class conclude and then we'll look at it. 
ओके थैंक यू ओके थैंक यू so we have looked at uh, the design of steel columns before uh, we have looked at various terms like effective length slenderness ratio buckling of columns euler's critical load and so on the only thing that we are changing now is we are moving from steel to concrete so all the fundamentals remain the same it's only a matter of now handling uh, the material in terms of all the uncertainties it brings and all the all the parameters which are related to concrete as a material so we've seen that uh, am i audible yes yes yeah okay so we've seen that compression members are subjected predominantly to actual compression forces Co columns and walls are such, such sections in uh, reinforced concrete buildings now uh, there's there's a way that the the ice code separates columns from pedestals that it says that if the effective length to least radial dimension is greater than equal to 3 it can be called as a column if not it can be called as a pedestal then there are also members which are subject to axial force as well as a significant amount of bending moment very common examples uh, we have seen very common examples of this kind and uh, particularly we can say that edge columns or corner columns are examples of beam columns uh the first thing that we do in reinforced concrete is we sort of try to classify columns based on different criteria for example we can classify columns based on the type of reinforcement this reinforcement is actually the horizontal reinforcement or or the or the the stirrups that the <coughs> that are commonly referred to so based on the type of reinforcement it the column can be tied column in a tied column the horizontal reinforcement is in the form of is in the form of stirrups similar to what is seen in the beams or we could have spiral columns in which the uh, horizontal reinforcement is in the form of spirals we look at the sketch in the next slide and then composite columns in composite columns the reinforcement is in the form of structural steel sections then based on the type of loading columns can be classified as actually loaded hello um we can't see your screen marker okay a moment Can you see it now? Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. Okay. 
So <clears throat> we classify columns based on either the type of reinforcement or the type of loading or based on slenderness ratio. Uh, based on type of loading, a column can be either actually loaded. So uh, an example of an actually loaded column, a purely actually loaded column, can be an interior column in a building that has same span in all the directions and has the same loading as well. Then an example of a column with actual load and uniaxial bending is an edge column, which has slab discontinuous on one side. And we can expect this column to be under actual load and a significant amount of bending about one axis. And the example of an actually uh, of a column with actual load and backsail bending is a column that is located at the corner of the building, which has slab discontinuous on two on two sides, and we can expect it to have significant amount of bending about both the axes. But the classification that is important uh, to us from a structural point of view is the classification based on slenderness ratio. We've seen this in the past. We we have looked at short columns and we have looked at slender columns, okay? And we've also looked at the criteria for defining a short and a slender column in steel. Now we're gonna look at the same criteria in concrete. So for the first type of class classification, if the reinforcement is in the form of stirrups, it is called as a tight column. If the horizontal reinforcement is in the form of spirals, it is called as spiral column. And if the vertical reinforcement is in the form of structural steel sections, it is called as a composite column. Then uh, based on the type of loading, if the actual load acts exactly at the geometric center or, or the centroid of the cross section, the column is said to be actually loaded. If the load is eccentric about one axis, so in this case, you can see that the load is eccentric about the major axis. Now, just a quick uh, revision as to what a major axis is and what a minor axis is. Okay, so the axis about which the moment of inertia is higher, that axis is called as major axis. Okay, so in this case, uh, this axis that you see here is a major axis and this is the minor axis. So in this, in this sketch, uh, the load is eccentric with respect to the major axis and therefore the column will experience actual load with uniaxial bending in the other exam in the other uh, in the next sketch what you see is that the load is eccentric with respect to the major axis as well as the minor axis okay x axis is being referred to as a major axis here it doesn't matter what you refer to as you can call this xx you can call it zz whatever okay so the load is eccentric with respect to x axis and y axis as well and therefore the column will experience actual load with bi axial bending in uh, uh, in our syllabus we are only going to look at columns that are subject to actual load and we are talking and we are going to talk about what are called as minimum eccentricities but that, that, that's something for uh, <clears throat> of future reference but uh, but as such we are not going to look at columns with actual load and uni actual bending or actual load with bi axial bending we are going to only look at the simple case of actual load. So, uh, as I said before, what is important for us from a structural point of view is to classify if the column is short or slender. Okay. Now, uh, slenderness, we normally classify, okay, just before that, uh, this question has been asked almost every year in the examination to sort of ask differences between a short column and a slender column or to define a short column and a slender column. So it is essential that you understand conceptually. <clears throat> so please pay attention for a moment here. So uh, <clears throat> a column can be classified as short or long depending upon whether the slenderness effects are significant or insignificant. Okay, I'll repeat this. A column can be classified as short or long depending upon whether the slenderness effects are significant or insignificant. Now, what are these slenderness effects? Before that, what is slenderness? So, slenderness is the geometric property of a section which is related to its ratio of effective length and lateral dimension. Okay, the 
we we define slenderness ratio in steel is we said the slenderness ratio is the ratio of effective length to radius of gyration okay that definition sort of captured all uh, all types of sections that you could use for a column a single term radius of gyration can capture an i section a t section uh, a channel section a built up section box section whatever it it just covers all the sections uh i s456 has sort of uh, simplified this when it comes to designing reinforced concrete columns because majority of the columns that we deal with are rectangular okay there's there's no, there's a not, not a lot of uh, different types of shapes that we deal with therefore instead of uh, looking at radius of gyration it simply says that slenderness ratio is effective length upon lateral dimension that's it okay so now what happens is we have two slenderness ratios first is a slenderness ratio about x axis that is a major axis and the slenderness ratio along y axis okay so if you look at this diagram x is a major axis y is a minor axis dx is the major dimension dy is the minor dimension now yes a question arises as to be uh, uh, before that uh, lex is the unsupported length about major axis and ley is the unsupported length about minor axis now a simple question arises as to why is lex different from ley because the column is the same so why is it that there are two unsupported lengths can someone just look at the sketch and answer this question Okay. Did you understand the question? So we are talking about unsupported lengths. Unsupported lengths means if you are if you are standing on a slab, you see a column and then you see a slab or a beam on the top. So the length of the column between the slab on which you are standing and the slab or the beam that frames it in the column is called as unsupported length. Now a simple question is: Is there a possibility that the slenderness or uh, the unsupported length uh say <clears throat> about the major axis is different from the unsupported length about the minor axis <clears throat> okay so if you look at this sketch this sketch shows a column and it shows two beams that are framing into the column okay there's there's a beam that is uh, hatched in gray and then there is another beam you see that the depths of these two beams are different okay now the beam that is hatched in gray is going to brace this column when it bends or when it uh, sort of buckles about x axis when it bends about uh, sorry buckling is a wrong word here so when when it sort of bends about x axis and the column that you see uh, uh which is not hatched the, the column that you see the, the beam that you see in white uh that is the beam in this direction it braces the column when it bends about y axis in this sketch the depths of these two beams are different and therefore you see that lx which is the unsupported length when the column bends about x axis is different from ly if the beams are of the same depth then lex would be equal to ly or lx would be equal to ly therefore no problem there okay so just to consider the possibility that the depths of the beam might be different we just say that okay uh, we have two unsupported lengths lx and ly therefore the slenderness ratio for bending about x axis is the ratio of effective length lex upon dx the dx is the major dimension and then lambda y is equal to ley upon dy simple 
what slenderness actually is is it is a measure of the vulnerability to failure of column by elastic buckling you've seen this before larger the value of lambda slender the column and lesser is the load that the column can take therefore we can say that slenderness ratio is a measure of vulnerability to column to fail by elastic buckling so now how do we classify this how do we classify columns as short or long depending upon their slenderness ratio now uh let me give you a wrong answer first now there's a number uh, i wouldn't say it is a wrong answer but it is a, it is uh, it is an answer that does not involve any understanding so the code says that you can say that a column is short if both the slenderness ratios are less than 12 okay and normally this is this is the answer that i see on this is the answer that i see maximum number of times so whenever it has been asked to differentiate between a short column and a long column it is straightforward written that if the slenderness ratio is less than 12 it is a short column if the slenderness ratio is more than 12 sorry if the slenderness ratio is more than 12 it is a long column factually it is correct but in terms of understanding it is not so a column is said to be short when the slenderness effects are not significant meaning that columns with relatively low slenderness ratio fail under ultimate loads with the material reaching its ultimate strength and not by buckling and such columns are called as short columns okay very simple to understand if a column is short it is not going to it is likely that it will not buckle and the ultimate failure is going to occur by the a uh, crushing of of the section and hence in a short column at ultimate loads the failure occurs by material reaching its ultimate strength and not by buckling <clears throat> another thing that is involved here is that the secondary moments are negligible in short columns now uh, i actually don't want to get into what secondary moments are or what p delta moments are but i think it is uh it i think it's imperative or or it is a sort of um, important uh, when we are differentiating between short columns and long columns to state that the secondary moment or the p delta moment are negligible in short columns so if you want i could go on and explain what secondary moments are but if we truly want to stick to what is important to us i think we don't have reason enough to get into what secondary moments are or what p delta moments are but this definitely adds to our answer as to what short columns are so, and the third thing is the slenderness ratios about x axis or the slenderness ratios for bending about x axis and bending about y axis both are less than 12 in such a case we say that the column is short so there are three things first the failure occurs by or the failure occurs by material failure and not by buckling number 2 the secondary moments which are also called as p delta moments are negligible in short columns and number 3 both the slenderness ratios are less than 12 so only three points you can say that the column is short in contrast to this long columns with relatively high slenderness ratio are likely to fail at relatively low compressive loads by buckling and not by material failure point number 2 secondary moments or p delta moments are significant in long columns and point number 3 the slenderness ratio lambda x or lambda y are greater than 12 then the column can be classified as long okay point number 1 failure occurs by buckling point number 2 secondary moments are significant point number 3 the slenderness ratio either about x or about y or both Far greater than twelve. Simple classification, short and long. Any questions here? Okay, am I audible? Are you guys awake? Are you guys thinking? Yeah, you're uh, you're audible. Yeah, okay. So, any questions as to what? as to what is a short column what is a long column what does this mean what does that mean
Okay, perfect. So uh, when we are talking about uh, standardist ratio, we are talking about effective length. And just to quickly brush up as to what effective length is, so we've seen we've looked at this definition before. Just um, just a quick revision: the effective length of a column in a given plane is defined as the distance between points of inflection or points of zero moment in the buckle configuration of the column in that plane. Simple. If you if you just look at the buckle shape of the column, we sort of uh, the effective length is a measure of the distance between the points of inflection of the points of zero bending moment we have understood this with sketches in theory of structures 5 therefore i'm not going to get into it so the effective length sort of depends upon what are the boundary conditions or what are the end restraints that the column uh, that, that have been applied to the column so if uh, both the ends of the column are pinned we can say that the effective length which is denoted by kl k is the k is the effective length ratio if both the ends are pinned, it is safe to say that effective length is equal to the unsupported length. Okay. If both the ends are fixed, then the effective length is equal to 0.5 times the unsupported length. If one end is fixed and the other end is pinned, effective length is 0.7 times of L. Okay. Now, uh, we have seen this uh, in steel as well, that the actual values or, or, or the values that are given by the code are slightly different from the theoretical values. Example given. Uh, so, so this is just a screenshot from the code. So if both the ends are fixed, as you see in sketch one, the theoretical value is 0.5L, but the recommended value of effective length by the code is 0.65L. Okay, now if I've taught you anything and you remember anything out of it, can someone please tell me what, uh, can, can someone please tell me why is it that the recommended value is different from the theoretical value? You can just attempt to answer it. If it's, you know, if it needs, if it needs some correction, I'm there to help. Uh, if you sort of lose track, I'm there to bring you back. But it's important that you attempt it. Uh, maybe it's a safety. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, okay. It is correct that uh, in a generic way, it is correct that it is for safety. But why? Like, why do we need to deviate? We, we, we know for sure that according to our theory, it has to be 0 0.5 times of L. Then why do we say that, okay, let us consider this as 0 0.65 times of L. Maybe um, because you can't really... Yeah, please go on one by one, no problem. Yeah, so the fixed end is not like properly fixed. Even though you say that is fixed at one end, you'll still have some, uh, some kind of moments and forces happening. Maybe. Okay. Uh, what's your name? Uh, Driti. Driti, okay. That, that was the answer that I was looking for. Very good. Uh, someone else was also answering. Please go on. Uh, yeah, no, I was saying the same thing. You can't achieve that um, same level of, of, of the theory. You can never really achieve it in, in practice. So, um, to account yes, for those yes. things. Yes, you, the, the answer is exact. That we cannot uh, or practically the degree of fixity that we are looking at is is rare in actual practice you can say that the column is fixed at the bottom perhaps only when it is getting it is sort of anchored securely into a foundation with uh, with no chance for any deflection with no chance for any rotation or deflection we can say that a column is fixed at the top only when it is framing into a beam that is much stiffer than the column itself so practically, uh, though concrete is uh, the concrete frame is is monolithic, or or the beam column joins are monolithic, but still we cannot achieve full fixity that we are talking theoretically in practice. There's always going to be some amount of rotation, okay? And therefore, we uh, jump from 0.5 to 0.65. Now the question is, why do we jump from 0 0.6, 0 0.5 to 0.65 and not from 0 0.5 to say 0 0.4?
okay more than these numbers the understanding of why these numbers have been increased or decreased uh, i think it matters more so, <clears throat> so why do we jump from 0.5 to 0.6 and not from 0.5 to 0.4 uh, so the bending moment is usually considered to be zero for the end motion it cannot like practically be zero so maybe that pressure can increase uh i would say no that's that's not actually why we why we are increasing the value of effective length can someone can someone does someone want to try to answer this question why are we increasing the effective length why are not we reducing it um i it's inversely proportionate right to the um... yes exactly see we have said this a million times larger the unsupported height of the column or larger the length of the column or the most length of the column the lesser is the amount of load that it can take okay so 0.65 l is definitely going to take lesser load than 0.5 l and the, the nara that we have been following all along is overestimate loads underestimate capacity okay now here we going to underestimate capacity by uh, saying that okay even though theoretically it is 0.5 l but let us safely assume that it is 0.65 l because we cannot achieve the sort of fixity that we want in actual practice so underestimate capacity how can you do so by increasing or by by sort of uh, overestimating your slenderness Uh, okay, I will not use the word overestimate. It, it might be confused. So, how can we underestimate our strength by increasing our effective length? Because the amount of load that can carry is inversely proportional to the slenderness ratio. Okay, so a uh, very good answer. So, uh, I I think you you've already gone through these numbers, but uh, nonetheless, I would tell you that please remember. the values of effective length uh, the, these are the snapshots from code we might not uh, want to get into all the data that has been given but what is important is if both the ends are fixed the effective length is 0.65 times of l if one end is fixed and the other end is hinged it is 0.8 times of l uh, please give me a moment yeah if both the ends are pinned then it is 1l uh and uh, I, i suppose this is a condition that we might not encounter in our questions so if one end is fixed and the other end is free it is 1.5 times of l so we, you have to remember these three cases both ends fixed one end fixed and one end pinned for which it is 0.8l and then both ends pinned for which it is 1l you to remember these three conditions okay uh others are just for your information so th this is a cantilever condition wherein one end is fixed and the other end is free that time it is two times of l so now we are going to jump into the actual design of columns uh and we are look we are going to look at it in uh in terms of three requirements that we must satisfy first is the slenderness limits second is minimum eccentricity and third is re reinforcement so uh we've seen that slenderness in a column results in reduced strength larger the slenderness lesser is the load that the column can take if we define this load or the maximum load that the column can take we define it as critical load now i would just like to remind you of what we look what you looked in the past so we have looked at this curve uh, uh as to how a short column behaves as to how a slender column behaves and then uh, we have looked at the equation given by euler that is the euler's critical euler's critical load for buckling which we have defined as pi square ei by kl square okay the point being the critical buckling load is inversely proportional to the square of effective length so if the column is very slender it might happen 
that the column or very slender columns are likely to fail suddenly under small loads due to instability rather than due to material failure. To prevent this failure, the code says that the maximum unsupported length to lateral dimension ratio that you can practically have is 60. Meaning that, okay, so what does this mean? So if you have an unsupported length of say six meters, which is 6,000 mm, the maximum ratio that you can have is 60. Meaning that the minimum dimension that you will have to give is 100 mm. Irrespective of if the column takes any load or irrespective of the magnitude of the load that the column carries. So for a six meter unsupported length, the minimum dimension that you'll have to have is 100 mm. That is what the columns, uh, that is what the code says. In no case will you have a dimension of less than 100 mm. So this is something that normally, uh, normally we satisfy. Now, even architects satisfy this requirement, but this is just for our information that if you want to give any columns that are just for elevation, that do not take any load, you want them in reinforced concrete, make sure that the ratio of unsupported length upon lateral dimension is less than 60. Simple. So this is about slenderness limits. Next. Now, uh, though we are dealing with columns that are subject to only actual forces and no moments, but there are a number of situations, there are a number of practical situations in which, though at first the column might seem to be subject to actual force only, but because of certain conditions, it might also be subject to moments about either one or both the axis. Now, such conditions are lateral loads not considered in the design. For example, if there's there's a building that is not being designed for uh, not being designed for earthquake, not being designed for wind, in that case, obviously you you have lateral loads that are not considered in the design. Then uh, live load placements not considered in the design. For example, uh, consider that you have three classrooms, three adjoining classrooms, uh, and and you have a, you have a column in between two classrooms. So you can see that all the spans in all the directions are same and my column will be subject to actual load only and not moment. But what if there's a class taking place only in only the, only in one of the classes and the, the other room is vacant? At that time, you have live load only on one side and there's no live load on the other side. Because of that, there's going to be a differential moment. So live load placements, if it is not considered in the design, you can have moment. Then accidental lateral or eccentric loads and errors in construction or misalignment. So if the alignment of the column itself is not straight, if there's some eccentricity in it, you, you'll definitely have some amount of moment coming in. So to make sure that such minor uh, things are taken into consideration, the code says that you have to design the column. So irrespective of the type of column, irrespective of the column uh, being subject to actual load, actual load and in actual bending, actual load and actual bending, it has to be designed for certain minimum eccentricities. Okay. Now, when we say that the column has to be designed for minimum. Okay. Have you already washed out the time? Okay. I'm, I'm really sorry for this. Uh, we just end up in a few minutes. So, uh, <clears throat> when the code says, when the code says that it has to be designed for certain minimum eccentricities, what it means is that it has to be designed for a minimum moment about x-axis and a minimum moment about y-axis. Simple. So what it says is the minimum eccentricity is L by 500 plus D by 30 or 20 mm, whichever is greater. This L is the unsupported length uh, for bending about x-axis and dx is a major dimension. Okay. So to, to give you a feel of the numbers, so if the unsupported length is say three meters, if the story height is three meters, and if the column is say 300 by 300, so in that case, the minimum eccentricity would be three meters, which is 3000 divided by 500 plus 300 divided by 30, which is 16 mm. So you'll have two numbers, 16 and 20. So you have to choose whichever is greater. So the minimum eccentricity would be 20. Similar similar case for the uh, for eccentricity about y-axis, the minimum eccentricity is Ly by 500 
or dy by 30 or 20 mm whichever is greater so the column has to be designed for a minimum eccentricity what it means is that the column has to be designed for a minimum moment about x axis and a minimum moment about y axis can you uh, I, I just hope that you can uh, link what uh, you can set up a link between these eccentricities and moment uh, so so this moment is nothing but actual load times eccentricity okay so when you are designing something for a minimum eccentricity you are basically doing it for a minimum moment okay now how how do we get here moment is equal to actual load times lever arm so p into e so when you are designing for e minimum you automatically design for a minimum moment so m minimum is equal to p into e minimum so basically what the code says is that you have to design it for uh, an actual load of p whatever is occurring then you have to design it for mx minimum and you have to design it for my minimum okay so uh, we'll end the lecture with this there are only a few slides to go and we are good to design a column okay if you have any questions please go on uh, if not thank you for your patience and we'll meet again either on tuesday or on saturday i'll let your class representatives know okay thank you for your patience uh, and we'll just uh, if in case no one has any questions we'll just sort out the quiz thing